Hey guys, it's Lily, and today on that book review, I'm gonna be reviewing Clockwork Prince by Cassandra Clare. So I really love the book. I think I liked it a little better than Clockwork Angel. Not because Clockwork Angel was bad, because Clockwork Angel is like a 5 out of 5 stars. I think to describe it better would be Clockwork Prince is like 6 out of 5 stars. I just, I don't get it how Cassandra Clare can get even better than she already is. So many things happen in this book. It's like one thing hits you right after another. It was just crazy, so much happened, and it was so good. <laughs> On Goodreads, I gave it a 5 out of 5 stars, and for a lettering grade, I would give it between an A- and an A. So without further ado, let's get into the spoilery section. Actually, before I get into the spoilery section, I want to address something that may or may not spoil you for Clockwork Princess. So if you haven't read Clockwork Princess yet, please mute the video until this picture somewhere over here of Clockwork Princess disappears. <sighs> so the process that I go through to review a book is read the book and jot down things and notes while I read and then jot down more stuff after I finish reading and then a day or two before I film the video I like to go and watch my favorite booktubers and their review on the book. I do that just to make sure I don't miss anything because my goal for these reviews is to tell you guys everything that you need to know and you can fangirl along with me. I was watching Jesse the Reader's review on Cockroach Prince. I like to read the comments. Um, it's kind of like fangirling with people that aren't there. And I'm scrolling through the comments thinking that it's safe because after all, this is a review for Cockroach Prince. But no, like the fifth comment from the top was like, Jesse thinks Wessa is endgame, but he doesn't know the twist that's coming up. A thousand possibilities of what can happen in Clockwork Princess just run through my brain. First thought, Will's gonna die. He's gonna die. He's gonna die of a noble act. He's gonna save Tessa or something. He's gonna like bite the bullet for her instead. And I was like, oh my god, he's gonna die Triss style. And the next one was like, well no, no, he can't he can't die. I mean Everyone who's read the book loves Will Herendel. Like, no way is he gonna die. Plus, I don't know exactly what happens, but I mean, Jace has to happen, so he can't die, right? He can't die. So then my next one is that, oh my god, she realizes that she has feelings for Jem and not Will. But then I was like, no, that, that just possibly can happen, so the only other possibility would be that they all die. And that's the big twist that happens so that Wessa can't happen. Honestly, I don't know, but um, I'll just find out when I read Cockroach Princess. Another thing that spoiled by was knowing that Tessa is a warlock. And I can thank the Shadowhunters TV show for that. Thanks, Magnus. But anyways, sadness aside, let's get on with the review. Guys, so much happened in this book, I just don't know where to start with this review. Just a means a traitor, Jem proposes to Tessa. But Will finds out his curse is fake, then he tries to pronounce his love for Tessa, but Tessa tells him that she's engaged to Jem. Charlotte and Hunter are having a baby. Gideon and Sophie. Oh my god, there's so much more, I just don't know where to start. But I think I'm going to start it off with talking about Will's curse. So, at the end of Clockwork Angel, we are left hanging with Will going to Magnus' house for help. So, before I even start the series, just from like you know, hearing it on YouTube and stuff, I knew that Will was being a jerk face because he had to be a jerk face. So that cliffhanger wasn't like so bad for me and plus I had all the books with me so I could just start it right away. But I was so curious to know what the reason is for him to being a jerk face. I actually guessed that it would be somewhere along the lines like whoever he loves will get hurt. And I was actually, you know, pretty close because the curse is whoever loves him will die. You know, a lot of people might say it's already used, expected, cliche, but really it's not. The already used, expected, and cliche is whoever he loves will get hurt, 
But Sandra made it just a little bit more original by saying that everyone who loves him. And that's so much harder because he can't control other people feel. So to make sure no one dies, he has to become a jerk face. Make sure everyone hates him, therefore no one will die. So that's why he runs away from his family. But then he realizes the Institute is his second family, so he has to make sure that everyone in the Institute hates him. He does that awful thing that he does to Tessa in the beginning of Clockwork Prince. And he just needs to shut everyone out so that no one will get hurt. And actually a perfect example is Gabriel's and Gideon's sister. See, so she loved, or at least liked, love Will. And even though Will didn't love her back, he had to make sure that she wouldn't get hurt. So what he did was humiliate her. I think it was at a party, a Christmas party. So he reads a poem out of the diary about her like confessing her love for Will in front of everyone at the party. And that's just what he had to do to make sure that she wouldn't get hurt. But one of Will's main goals throughout this whole entire book is to find the demon that cursed him and to have him break it. And when he finally finds the demon, the demon tells him, Just kidding, um, that curse was a lie. Um, I was too weak to curse you, so, um, sorry. And just in that moment, I was like, oh my god, for five years, Will has done everything to make everyone hate him, thinking that he was protecting them, but really, it was all for nothing. You guys know that feeling when you're up till like 1 in the morning, finishing a homework for your class the next day, and then you get to that class, and the teacher tells you that, oh, that's due next week. Yeah, imagine that five years longer. Yeah, that's what Will felt. <laughs> I felt so bad for him. Like, it's so unimaginable. Like, how, like knowing that he did all of that for nothing. It literally meant nothing. <laughs> I'm just, I just feel so sorry for him. But now that he knows that the curse is fake, he can go back and run to Tessa and tell him how he really feels. <laughs> but obviously, there's a knock on Tessa's door, but it's not Will, it's Jem. So let's talk about Jem a little bit. Jem is a nice guy. I, I decently liked him um, up until the point he proposed to her, but before he proposed to her, I decently liked him. I thought that if Will really was a jerk face for real life, then, like, you know, go with Jem. He brings Tessa to things that she will enjoy, like, I forget exactly where it was, but it was like a cemetery with all these poets and stuff, and She's like, you don't like poetry, and he's like, well, if you like it, then I do. Like, that was really sweet. But then he proposes to her, and I'm like, no. And then, you know, I'm here a little nervous, but I'm like, calm down. Tessa is smart. You know, at the end of Clockwork Angel, she last minute changes into another girl who's spewing blood everywhere, and Mortimane thinks that she's dead, but she's not. She tricked Mortimane. She is smart. She will tell Jem that she needs a little bit of time. <laughs> but no, um, out of pity, because he tells her that his love for her is keeping him alive, she says yes. She has to tell herself that she loves him. And sorry, Tessa, but if you need to tell yourself that you love him and that you're, you're getting engaged to him, then it's not really love. And not to mention, throughout the book, she friend zones him so much. You know, and then just after the proposal, I started like hating Jem. He just seemed so selfish to me. And I started thinking, how in the world is Jem and Will, who are pair but tie, do not realize that they both love the same person? If you know someone so well, you, you should be able to tell if they love someone. Or at least I know from Will's point of view that he was generally surprised that Jem loved Tessa, but I don't know about Jem. It can go either way, but I, I can't help but think that he purposely didn't talk about it because he knew that they both loved the same person. I mean, they're both smart people. They're not dumb. You know, it's all messed up. It's a love triangle that's so tangled that, that, that you can't do anything about it because she can't leave Jem because Jem might die, but after Jem dies, Will's not going to get together with Tessa because he wouldn't betray Jem. And then I'm just like, ugh. Another thing that really got on my nerve that Jem did was when he was confessing to Will that he proposed to Tessa, he said, oh, I have to ask you, um, did you save Tessa for my sake because you knew that I loved her? And, you know, Will being a good person, he says yes, but 
in my head, I was like, oh my god, Jem, can you be even more selfish than you are right now? Maybe he really isn't selfish. I think I'm just really mad that this happened because I want Wessa. I want Wessa, not Jessa. I think, I guess, he's a good person, right? I don't know, just everything after the proposal, I just view Jem as a selfish person. And I know that he's not, but it just feels like he's a selfish person. Oh, and another relationship thing. Just of mine fell in love with Nate, and she betrayed the Institute. The people who love her as family, she betrayed them because she believes very strongly that she's in love with Nate. I can't tell if Nate genuinely loves her back, but I mean, he says it a lot that he does, but you know, I just don't trust him. I can see Jessamine doing it, but I just couldn't process that it actually happened. And at first when, like, you know, I read the part where she's seeking out in boy clothes, I thought that she secretly still wanted to be a shadow hunter. So she was, like, going out and doing shadow hunter things. Because, you know, girl shadow hunters don't really dress like girls did in that era. But, no, she was betraying everyone that loves her. And Nate, oh my god. So he used to actually test his cousin, and he's just... I, I'm glad that he died. <laughs> oh my god, I'm going back to like whole, the whole Will thing and the curse. When he was confessing his love for Tessa, I was literally crying. My heart was breaking so bad for him because the one thing that he wants, he can't have. Like he was just like, like breaking on the inside. And I just, I can't imagine how that would feel. Like I wanted so bad for Tessa to just be like, you know what, I'm going to break it off with Jem, but she can't, and I know that she can't, and it's, it's like everyone's stuck in between a hard place and a rock. Like, like you just can't do anything because you can just mess up everything if you move one little bit. But let's talk about happier times, like all the Wessa moments in the book. I was literally so excited when Tessa and Will went to Bendix's party, and they have this whole cute kissing scene. But then uh, Magnus has to ruin it by telling us that warlock stuff makes you a little bit crazy. So Tessa takes it as she doesn't really love Will, but ugh. Okay, oh, and also there's Gideon and Sophie. Oh, I really love them so much. I hope everything works out with them, that um, somehow she's able to be with them. And maybe she becomes a shadow hunter because I think they have the mortal cup, so maybe she should become a shadow hunter and they can live happily ever after. And the last relationship thing is Charlotte and Henry. I am so glad they're not blind anymore. It was so obvious that they both loved each other in the first book, but they just didn't see it. Charlotte thought that Henry only married her because his father was in debt to her father, and Henry thought that Charlotte only married him because she needed a man to run the institute. And now they finally both know that that's not true and that they actually love each other, they married for love, and I was just so excited because they were so cute and I'm so glad that everything worked out with them. And honestly, I don't need the relationship causing me stress because I already have to worry about the tangled triangle. <laughs> okay, so now I'm going to go a little more like, you know, plot review. So we start off with Benedict asking Council Willen if he can run the Institute instead of Charlotte because women are incapable of doing things because it's not in their nature. So Charlotte and the gang have two weeks to find Mortemain to prove her worthiness. And that's hard because Mortemain is very sneaky. He's a very sneaky mundane. And then Benedict says that Tessa and Sophie need a little bit of training. So he volunteers his sons to train them. And that's kind of how Gideon and Sophie end up together. Gideon is a good person, good head on his shoulders. But Gabriel, he might come off a little bit you know, not so great of a head on his shoulders. Really, I think he is a decent guy. He just needs some guidance. After all, he was raised by Benedict Lightwood, who, you know, sleeps with demons and gets demon pox. But I did like that like, he's a family person. When Gideon leaves, Gabriel's like, but what about father? Like, I can't just leave him alone. Like, like that. That's that's a good aspect of him. I think he just needs a little bit of guidance to be like a moral person. Oh, and get two new servants because Thomas and Agatha died. It's very sadly, I, I was so sad that Thomas died. But anyways, we get Thomas's brother, which I can't pronounce his name, and a cook named Bridget. And is Bridget kind of weird? Yes. She sings these really sad and creepy ballads, and they always somehow parallel with the story. Like at the very end when. 
when Jem is telling everyone that he and Tess are getting married. Bridget sings a song. It's like, oh, the one that I love. His name is William. Something like that. And I was just like, hmm. If that's not foreshadowing, I don't know what is. Thanks to the Shadowhunters TV show, I remember that Ho I was going to say Hogwarts. <laughs> I remember that Hodge's last name is also Starkweather. So maybe, um, what's his, I forget his first name, but Mr. Starkweather and Clocker Prince, maybe he betrays them, like Hodge betrays, betrays Clary Lightwood in the Moral Instruments. So throughout the series, we don't really know what Infernal Devices mean, but in this book we find out that Henry made an infernal device and it blows up the Automatron and I think another one's called the Confuser, but he will probably make more and that give more of a understanding of why the series is called the Infernal Devices. At first I thought the Infernal Devices were like the angel and the cane and then on cover is the book. Those are the three things that they're holding on the covers. Oh, but now that I realize on these ones, it's a sword, a violin, and nothing. So, um, I know, that's just what I thought. But then I looked up what infernal means, and it's like demonic. So that wouldn't really make much sense, because an angel is not d demonic. And we find out in this book that Mortmain is the clockwork prince, because his warlock parents were, or more like his dad, was, um, really into the making of automatrons and stuff. And his dad used to call him a prince, I think, so that's why he's the clockwork prince. Um, I'm sorry, but I forgot who is the clockwork angel. I really admire the people who can remember every detail in these series. Like, honestly, I don't remember what happened in which book with the moral instruments. Just, like, one whole blur for me. So, um, whatever Tessa really is is still a question as of this book. It's thrown out that she might be part shadow hunter, part demon, even though those usually result in a stillborn. She could also be some sort of like fairy changeling. Like what exactly was the creature at Benedict's party that was talking to Tessa that could see through her disguise? Okay now I'm kind of like jumping around. Do you guys think that Will was out of line for going to the opium den and that he should have thought of Jem? Or do you think that Jem was overreacting and a little selfish when he freaked out on Will? And what do you think of Will taking Tessa's um letters and reading them. At first I was a little bit like, eh, but then I was like, you know what, that's sweet. He was just trying to get to know her because after all he can't really show affection towards her or then she'll return the feelings and then she might die, but even though the curse is fake, but you know, he didn't know that at the time. And like the whole gem overreacting thing, at first I thought he was overreacting, but the more that he was like talking to Will about it, the more I was like, okay, yeah, that's reasonable. And Will going to the opium dens to escape from his reality is okay, I guess, because I mean, for five years he's doing this and doesn't even know if it's really worth it or not. And then when he can't find the demon, obviously he's stressed out. I mean, I bet there's better ways to cope with it. So the scene where they're going to Starkweather's house in the train, I think, um, Jem, Will, and Tessa are talking about like their inner souls or something. And Tessa asks Will, what's the color of your inner soul? And Will says, it's Maeve. I looked up the definition of Maeve and it's a pale purple color. And, you know... Why is Will's inner soul a pale purple color? But I did find one small connection. The person who made the color, his name was William. I know. Probably doesn't mean anything, but... <laughs> oh my god, did you guys love Will's song about the demon pox? Demon pox, oh demon pox, just how is it inquired? One must go down to the bad part of town until one is very tired. Demon pox, oh demon pox, I had it all along. No, not the pox, you foolish blocks, I mean this very song. For I was right and you were wrong. <laughs> and then Charlotte goes, Will! Have you lost your mind? Seize that internal racket. But Charlotte, I wanted Will to keep singing. And lastly, I just want to talk about the ending of the book. So we leave off with the courtroom or whatever, and Charlotte won her case. I feel like I'm talking about some law show, but no, I'm talking about Shadowhunters. And Benedict lost, and we end off with Council Will and witnessing the automatrons that Mortimane can create. We go back, and now we're at the Institute, and we're having a lovely celebratory dinner. Jim announces that just was happening, and Charlotte and Henry announce that they're having a baby, and Bridget sing a sad song about how Wessa should happen, and then 
Will's little sister comes to the Institute. My first impression was to not trust her because, you know, somehow Mortimer could have influenced her and sent her as a spy to spy on the Institute, have an insider. But then, you know, I thought, I'm probably just overthinking it. She's probably there just to see her brother and because she wants to be a shadow hunter. But at the same time, Cassandra's sneaky. Like, that, that's probably going on. She's probably a spy. Whether I'm overthinking or not, who knows? We'll find out in Clockwork Princess. Before I get there, I had to read City of Lost Souls first. If you like this episode of that book review, please give it a thumbs up and subscribe if you haven't already. Also, check down my social media, which will be down there and on my end card. And yeah, have a great day, afternoon, wherever you are. Bye! And today I'm going to be doing a mystery unboxing. So I pre-ordered a bunch of books and I don't know when they're all coming. So I decided to make this series called Mystery Unboxing where every time I get the book, 